Well, thank you very much for the extremely kind invitation to come along and speak. Um, uh, it really is an honour uh, always to be invited to speak to your colleagues. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to be droning on about my personal hobby horse. So the fact that you've given me three opportunities today to drone on about the things that matter to me is, is a particular pleasure. But I do understand by now some of you will want to have a little nap, so if you do, it's dark and I won't notice. That's absolutely fine. I actually only have one side set. I said this in the last talk. I have one slide set and I've used it three times this afternoon. I have changed the order of the slides though, so hopefully it won't be too dull for you. I do have some disclosures which I've uh, listed here for you to review. So I work in East London in a hospital called the Royal London Hospital. Um, it was actually renovated and rebuilt by Skanska of all people. Uh, um, and we're very lucky now to have a modern and, and, and high performance hospital, but it still has the old character of a very, very busy uh, hospital dealing with lots and lots of emergencies. It sits in the heart of London's East End, uh, just a few miles from some of the richest parts of our country, the financial centre of, well, for the time being, Europe, but not for long. Uh, um, but also just a few minutes walk from some of the most deprived areas in Europe as well with the highest incidences of diseases like TB and so on. So it's a very interesting uh, place to work. You can see the sites, Tower Bridge, HMS Belfast down there, that's where Boris Johnson used to sit, someone different now, uh, and uh, a Tower of London as well. So lots of sites if you want to come and visit. Um, but what I really want to talk to you today is um, about something that really matters to me, and that's the idea that patients might undergo surgery, and we may in some way be casual about the harm that they experience at that time. Um, and a friend of mine has wanted to say that there's a Simpsons quote for every social situation. Uh, and if you think about it, it's actually true. Uh, um, and the sign outside Springfield Hospital says, come for the surgery, but stay for the complications. And the, and the message for me is, uh, after I've finished laughing at the expense of my surgical colleagues, the message is really that The Simpsons is not a comedy for anaesthetists and intensivists who want to tease their surgical colleagues. The Simpsons is a comedy for the general public. And if The Simpsons tells you a joke, it means it's relevant to the general public. So we can surmise from this popular comedy that the general public knows that there is this thing called complications. And they know that if a surgeon comes to them after major surgery and says, I'm really sorry, there's been a complication. They know that their life has changed. They know it's changed for the worst, and they know it may have changed permanently. Complications matter to people. They matter to the people we treat, and they destroy the very value of everything we turn up to work to achieve. And to say, uh, to me that it's important that we do everything we can to resolve that problem uh, uh, will be an understatement. And the solution to this is something called perioperative medicine. It's taking the successful approaches we've seen that have reduced harm in the operating room and delivering that concept, that approach to zero harm throughout the patient's per perioperative period from the moment of the decision to operate through to several months after the surgical procedure has been performed to prevent and treat the harm of surgery, but also the harm of anesthesia, because uh, the, the anesthesia can do harm as well. And why is this important? It's important because surgery is a huge production line. There, it's a huge factory that delivers surgery. We have large hospitals that are doing more and more and more operations for more and more and more patients. And as we get better and better at keeping people alive during surgery, we get better and better at offering high-risk patients surgical treatments. But what we haven't got better at is the post-operative care, the pre-operative assessment, and so on. So more and more people are being exposed to the risks of poor surgical outcomes. More and more people are being exposed to the risk of having a surgical treatment that wasn't right for them. And we either have to stop doing it or we have to get better at our job. 
And to get better at our job is not going to fall to one group of people. We can say if we like, it's the surgeon's job. It's their patients. It's not our responsibility. But we are doctors too. And looking after patients and improving patient care wherever they are is everybody's job and everybody's responsibility. And we cannot stand idly by and watch these things happen. So it is our job, it is our belief. And because there is so much surgery, even at a low rate of harm, we will see a high rate of, of um, overall number of overall people that experience harm. So if, as the estimates say, there are more than 300 million surgeries performed each year, we can guess that there may be 3 million deaths after surgery each year, more than TB more than HIV, more than trauma. How important does it have to be before we stop and look at it? And this is just the short-term deaths. This is just the short-term harm. This is not about the long-term harm patients experience. But by the same token, whilst this slide emphasizes the importance of improving outcomes after surgery, it all also illustrates the challenge. We need to do something. We need a solution that can be scaled to the biggest level in our hospital, that can be simplified to be delivered to all patients in a very, very effective way. And that's really the big challenge. It's making the novel treatment simple enough to be delivered to every patient every day effectively to improve their outcomes. And that's a really difficult thing to do, and that needs really great leadership and a really great understanding of the problem. And I think there will be fewer people in the world than those in this room who understand that problem better. And just to illustrate this, I've used this slide earlier in the day. Um, we often think about our craft, and we often think about our craft in a binary way as good or bad. You know, the patient is either intubated or they are not intubated. There is nothing in the middle as far as we are concerned. We either use a capnograph always or never. There's no maybe about that. But actually, often the harm that we're looking for doesn't offer itself up in a simple binary fashion. We're offering, looking at signals that you can only understand by measuring and counting things on a large scale, which is why big registries are becoming so important in improving perioperative care. Now this guy, my kids know who this guy is. His name is John Snow, not that John Snow, the other John Snow. Uh, uh, and this John Snow is famous because he counted something. He counted the number of people who had cholera in Soho in an epidemic in the mid-19th century. And by counting them and putting those numbers on a map, he was able to show that there was a preponderance of cholera around that bit of equipment, a pump in a street called Broad Street. And by disabling the pump by removing the handle, he was able to reduce the number of people who died from cholera. But at the same time as doing this, he was developing the craft of ether anesthesia and making it safe through his real-time understanding of what did or did not work. He was able, on the one hand, to be an epidemiologist and, on the other hand, to be a craftsman. And we must do the same thing. We must not seek refuge in our craft at the expense of the uh, public health approach to the care that we give our patients. We must be both things to deliver everything our patients need. And it's important that we reflect and look at the way we do our jobs to understand what's needed. And the reason for that is actually, again, comes from an industrial uh, 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 source. And this guy, w William Ed Edward Stemming, w actually worked on improving the quality of industrial systems. And he did that using data. He collected numbers to show where things were working well and where things were working not so well. And that data drove improvements in the systems and the efficiency of the systems. And he has a series of fantastic quotes, and I like this one, that unexplained variation is the enemy of quality. That we can look at what we do, and if what I do is different to what you do, that may be a matter of style. And that may be of personal importance to me, but it probably isn't of personal importance to the patient if our outcomes are the same. But if our patient outcomes are different, then that matter of style becomes an issue. 
and that matter of my style and something I want to do that delivers worse outcomes than your patients get becomes important and I need to be prepared to let my style go and adopt yours. So we need to learn from each other, which means we need to talk to each other. We need to measure our outcomes and we need to be prepared to change. And that is everybody's job. From the most senior to the most junior, we need to be able to have a philosophy of change. And that means leadership amongst us all. And in this room, mostly doctors, we are the ones that need to do this. It's only us that can make this happen. And we look at some of the data, and many of you in this room contributed to this study, and I'm very grateful to your support. Scandinavia does particularly well at the top of the, of the graph there, you can see, which illustrates very, very subtle, not marked, very subtle variation in mortality between countries. And you'll be amazed to hear that in Scandinavia, I got rave reviews about this study and w how good it was. Uh, uh, your outcomes are quite good there. But the countries at the bottom of this graph gave me very, very different feedback. Poland, I got a lot of criticism from Poland. And they offered up their own data to counter the data that I had published with my colleagues to show that I was wrong. Ireland, they offered up, they really didn't like being compared to Eastern Europe, by the way, uh, 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 which tells you something in itself about snobbery and the risks and the vulnerabilities we have because of snobbery. But anyway, they really didn't like being compared to Eastern Europe was what they perceived had happened. It wasn't what we did, but it's what they perceived had happened. And they also offered up their own data to reject what we said. As did Latvia, although to be fair to Latvia, they made a mistake with their data in the first place, which was why they featured where they featured. But there's one country in those four at the bottom there that did something different, and that was Romania. And do you know what Romania did? They didn't reject the findings of the study. They didn't attempt to denigrate me in public with letters to the Lancet, emails to my uh, 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 vice principal, or, or anything else. They took the data to the Minister for Health in, po in Romania, and they said, look, we've got a problem. And the Minister for Health gave them some money to improve perioperative care. And the lesson to me is, is, is salutary, that, that there are people out there that are prepared to put their own ego uh, of their own profession, of their themselves as individuals, as ahead of the outcomes of their patients, before they stop for just one moment and say, could it be right? Could it be true? It may not be true. These data may not be a fair reflection for those countries. That's entirely possible, and in fact, we always said that in the papers, cannot be used to judge individual countries. But could it be true before we reject it? And if we are not prepared to accept that we could be better, that we may not be good enough, we will not be able to improve our patients' outcomes. And that is really, really important, that it's a good and noble and worthy thing to seek to improve what you do. And we should not be afraid of it. And we should not feel vulnerable by stating that we want to be better. Because once you open that situation up, it becomes very safe. And you are very secure in, in the knowledge that you are seeking always to be better at what you do. Whereas those who seek to deny it are very vulnerable. They say they are perfect, but they're always vulnerable to being exposed. So it's actually a better place to be. And we can see from studies like ISOS, which again, a lot of people in the room made fantastic contribution to. You can see that variation. And when we ranked hospitals in ISOS by their complication rate, we saw almost five-fold variation in hospitals in complication rates, which is very, very striking. But what was odd was the pattern of variation in mortality was not the same pattern as the variation in complications. There were some hospitals that had a very high complication rate, but quite a low mortality rate. Now, was that because they had almost exclusively very low risk complications? Or was it that they were better at keeping people alive when they developed a complication? Was it that their post-operative surveillance was more effective? Were they better at identifying patients who had a complication and better at treating those complications so the patient didn't die? Now, that may or may not be the case, 
that you've got to agree that as a theory, it carries some weight. And so the obligation we have is to look at those data and understand whether we are one of those hospitals or we are one of those teams or one of those services that potentially could do what we do differently to improve our patient outcomes and to be more of the best of ourselves. So there's a lot of debate about this weekend effect in the UK at the moment because unfortunately our Minister for Health decided to have a big argument with our junior doctors which resulted in a strike and he kind of misrepresented research findings which made doctors dispute the validity of the research itself even though the research was valid and one bad behaviour drove another bad behaviour and neither group was really in the right on this. But we do know that if you have surgery on a Friday in the UK, you're more likely to die than if you have surgery on a Monday. Now, why could that possibly be if it's not because getting post-operative care from a skeleton service on day one and day two is not as good as getting post-operative care from your own surgical team if you have it on a Tuesday and a Wednesday compared to a Saturday and a Sunday? We don't know for sure why this observation exists. But we can guess. And we can guess at things that we need to look at. And we can guess at things that might need to be better. And whether or not it suits us to need to be in work at the weekend or not is what our patients need. And why did we go to medical school? And why did we become doctors? And why do we want the public to know we're doctors if we only want to be doctors some of the time? Medicine is a vacation. It's not a job. And in my service, I work at the evenings and the weekends as a scheduled job. It's not on call, come in when I like. I'm paid to be there on the floor looking after my team. And I work in a very big, busy hospital, um, so, so it makes sense. And not every hospital can do that, I completely realise. But actually, it's not so bad, because it gives you time off in the week to do stuff like this, which is a lot of fun. So it's not so bad. Which patients are we worried about? Well, we're obviously worried about all patients, but in particular we're worried about this high-risk patient who you know. They're the patient who's having major surgery. They're older, they've got chronic disease, they're often having emergency surgery, and we know they're more likely to get complications, and we know they're more likely to die. And there are lots of reasons for that, but possibly the biggest reason is this paradigm of inflammation the systemic inflammatory response that we see in the intensive care unit that our patients experience if they develop sepsis or if they're victims of trauma also happens after major surgery. It's less severe, it's less marked, but it causes the same pattern of non-specific organ injury that often can only be measured biochemically. So they're just as likely, perhaps not so severe, but they're just as frequently able to get acute kidney injury acute lung injury, myocardial injury, polyneuropathy and myopathy, and also delirium. And we know that these problems happen in our patients. And we know from the intensive care unit that patients who experience these organ injuries have poor long-term outcomes. So why do we not bother about these complications in the surgical population? Because if they have poor long-term outcomes for critical illness, then they're also going to have poor long-term outcomes for surgery. Maybe not so bad, but remember that denominator of 300 million. And there's a lot more patients having surgery than go to the intensive care unit. This is a very important public health problem that we can solve before I retire, because it's that simple. This isn't global warming. You know, this isn't antimicrobial resistance. This is an easy problem to solve that the people in this room have the power to, to tackle. And you look at this example of, of the vision study where they collected troponin data on patients, so a simple biochemical marker looking for myocardial injury in all patients having surgery who would not normally get this kind of screening. And they identified a pattern of myocardial injury. First of all, it was incredibly common. Well, over a third of patients experienced myocardial injury far more than anyone would have guessed. And the higher or more severe the myocardial injury, the more likely they were to die. And for every, any given troponin concentration, the patients were more likely to die than someone presenting to an emergency department with chest pain. That's 
quite a lot of likely to die. That's quite an important problem. We think how much trouble we go to developing services to deal with chest pain, and what are we doing to develop a service to deal with this problem? Almost nothing anywhere. And so we need to think about how we identify and treat this problem, which is different to classic MIs. It's different to the classic kind of myocardial infarction that we see. These patients are often asymptomatic. They have often no ECG changes, often no echocardiographic changes, and yet they're much more likely to die. We can find it simply with biochemical screening of a cheap blood test available in all of our hospitals. An acute kidney injury is the same. It's very common. We have a routine biomarker that we can use to screen all patients. It's tremendously cheap, tremendously easy to do, and often we do it and don't even consider the results. We may even find acute kidney injury, but because the patient's asymptomatic, we do nothing about it. And then the creatinine returns to normal, or the troponin returns to normal, and we figure the problem has gone away. The biomarker has returned to normal, but the patient hasn't. The organ injury was permanent. The damage it did was permanent. And those patients will then be in a category who are more likely to develop chronic disease. And if your patient develops chronic disease after surgery, you can assume that the surgery hasn't been the success the surgeon hoped for, the anaesthetist hoped for, but most of all that the patient hoped for. The patient is having surgery to have disease-free quality of life and survival. And anything that cause, caused by surgery that detracts from that success should weigh against the surgery as a good treatment option. And if we don't think about it in that way, then we're not really helping our patients make good decisions about surgery. So if we take a patient with mild chronic kidney disease, because they've got mild chronic kidney disease, they're more likely to get acute kidney injury when they have surgery. And so it happens. That means that they've got a more severe, uh, end up with a more severe variant of chronic kidney disease, which means when they get a chest infection, they get another episode of acute kidney injury. And indeed, every time they have an acute event, they develop further episodes of mild acute kidney injury, losing a few nephrons every time until they end up with end-stage renal disease. And this problem can be very debilitating for our patients. And unless we seek to recognize that acute harm not chronic disease, but acute harm is one of the biggest causes of chronic organ failure. And until we recognize that that acute harm is not something our patients get better from, we're not going to recognize the need to take a long-term approach in terms of the follow-up for the harm that patients have after surgery. So a lot of these patients would be referred on to a nephrologist or a cardiologist to whatever to deal with the chronic organ failure that they've developed, but only if somebody is there to spot who needs that onward referral and to make sure it happens and to make sure the physicians or whoever it might be has the information they need to look after that patient. There is lots that we can do in different areas of the perioperative period to improve our patient's outcome. We can modify surgery. We can even consider not doing surgery at all. We can modify the patient and we can modify the care that we give our patients. We can look at the perioperative period as a whole. This character is Doug, who you're going to meet again in a moment. And Doug has been scheduled for surgery. And what can we do to help him? Perhaps we can identify whether he's at a uh, higher risk of poor outcomes so that we can plan ahead and modify his risk uh, by, by delivering an enhanced standard of care. Or perhaps if we can't modify his risk, at the very least we can counsel him and advise him that he is likely to have a bad outcome and that maybe surgery is not the option that he wants. And we need more information to give our patients a better chance at making a shared decision with us. Because shared decision making is, is the future. It's not consent anymore. It's not you agreeing to let me do something to you. It's you and I making that decision together. There are options that we have now that we didn't have before that allow us to have flexibility around surgery. So we're no longer obligated to cut out a colorectal cancer because we can stent that cancer, which means the patient's less likely to obstruct, which may buy us time to optimize the patient and, and do the operation at a time that's better for them. Or it may mean that some patients can choose to die without surgery, as opposed to dying 
with surgery because some patients are that high risk. Not all of them, but the ones that are are the ones that account for a vast majority of the harm that we see. And I'm taking that philosophy and being prepared to ask the unanswerable question, the, is surgery really right for this particular patient? We can look at anemia. We know anemia is an enormous risk factor for poor outcomes after surgery. And think about doing simple things to modify patient outcomes without actually giving blood. When we get to the operating room, we can think about simple things like the checklist that have an important, subtle, difficult to see, but with big data, measurable improvement in survival for our patients. Simple things like how we set up these machines that we use every single day to care for our patients having major surgery can alter their short-term complication rate, which means we can alter their short-term mortality rate and alter their long-term outcomes too. Because if you can reduce the short-term acute harm, you can also reduce the long-term harm, which means you can also make surgery a better treatment for your patients, a more valuable treatment for your patient, which is, after all, what anesthesia and to a large extent intensive care are all about, about making surgery a better and more successful treatment for their patients. And there's a lot we can do there. We can even get our surgeons on board. Simple interventions like wound guards to reduce the rate of surgical site infection Ah, but surgical site infection is not that important, I hear you say. It is the single most common complication that patients experience. And you will not find a single patient who has had a surgical site infection who says it was not important to them. So regardless of what we think, whether we do or do not believe in the importance of certain bad outcomes, if our patients think they're important, they should be important to us because we work for our patients. That is our job. That is our role. That is our reason for being doctors in the first place. Early after surgery, we can get out of the operating room. Not all of us, but some of us can get out of the operating room and start following the patients up. And what can we do? A lot of people say there's nothing we can do. Well, some of the things we can do are to look at critical care technologies and whether they have value. And we'll see some, I presented some of this data earlier, looking at the value of ICU admission. And to my horror, as an ICU doctor who doesn't do anesthesia, I've completely failed to demonstrate any benefit from ICU admission at all. Oh my God. And then I looked at someone else's data, Hannah Wunsch from the US, and she failed also to demonstrate any benefit from ICU uh, admission after surgery. And this is getting quite nervous for me now. But when I talk to Hannah, she, like me, believes there must still be something important that we do in ICU. And then I start to think about what that might be, because it's not inhaled nitric oxide or renal replacement therapy, or my favorite high-frequency oscillatory ventilation. I do love that machine. I love all my machines and all my monitors and all my numbers. But it's something else. Because when we see a surgical patient on ICU, whether they look well or unwell, my colleagues say, we're not doing anything for them. We've got no machines here. They're not on inotropes. We're not doing any organ support. And yet I look at what they're getting. And this patient has been sat up, sat out, warmed up, woken up, their muscle relaxants reversed, they're pain-free, they're mobilizing, they've got early enteral nutrition, their drugs are being prescribed and administered properly, and if something goes wrong, they can get a doctor there quickly. It's about good nursing care. A good nursing care with ready access to a doctor, which turns out to be very important. Now, whether you call that ICU or you call it something else, I don't really care whether I lose my job if the patients don't die. I would be very satisfied to retire unemployed because we got so good at what we do that we needed fewer doctors. Now, it's unlikely to happen, so I'm feeling bold about that statement. But if you think about it, it's all of our jobs to make doctors unemployed, to make society need fewer doctors. In fact, we're recruiting more and more and more doctors all the time in all countries. So we need to look at what we can do to make patients less dependent on our care. Post-operative CPAP is another important treatment that may offer value and benefit for our patients. 
But it doesn't stop after the patient's gone home. Here we see Doug sitting on the sofa in his living room. He's had a complication which is more likely to die in the long term, even if the complication was minor. And depending on what surgery he's had, the chances of him benefiting in terms of quality of life can be very variable. If he had a hip replacement, he's got a good chance of getting improved quality of life. A knee replacement, less so, but still some value. Varicose veins and hernias, perhaps not. So if we're not looking at the benefit in terms of quality of life, we're not looking at the outcome that actually made the patient have surgery in the first place, which means we're not looking at the outcome that our job is there to deliver, which means we don't really know if we're doing a good job at all. And yet we're doing it every day and we're spending huge and vast sums of money on it. We also need to think about secondary prevention and the fact that our patients often present to us with undiagnosed, untreated chronic disease. And they have an opportunity for first contact with a doctor to make sure that there is screening of chronic obstructive airways disease, of diabetes, of heart disease. In my hospital, we just assume every patient has heart disease because it's so common. We just assume everybody has it. But do we refer those patients on for secondary prevention that we know can be very, very effective in improving patient outcomes and very cost-effective in improving patient outcomes? So if you're interested in this approach, you can go to the Royal College of Anesthetists website, rcoa.ac.uk, and you can read all about the perioptive medicine programme led by the college and how we take this approach. But if I haven't persuaded you, I'd like to take five minutes of your time just to watch a short film that perhaps can say it better than I can. At the Royal College of Anaesthetists, we've been thinking about how to make surgical care more efficient and effective by integrating the care patients receive before, during and after surgery. Around 10 million patients undergo surgery in the NHS every year, and we believe there's huge potential to make this system work better, particularly for the group of 250,000 patients at high risk of complications, who account for more than four out of every five deaths after surgery. Here's an example. Meet Doug. He's just been diagnosed with bowel cancer, and his surgeon has told him he needs an operation to remove the tumor. Doug's GP has also been treating him for lung disease caused by his smoking and is aware of some problems with his kidney function, but this is not making Doug feel unwell. In the current system, Doug's anaesthetist may not receive this information until the actual day of his operation. Despite the lung and kidney issues, it's thought that surgery is Doug's best option. Like the majority of operations, it's a technical success and the tumour is removed. But a few days after surgery, Doug's weakened lung function deteriorates and he develops pneumonia, so Doug is admitted to a critical care unit for more intensive treatment. He ends up staying in hospital five days longer than originally planned, before he's fit enough to go home with his family. As well as the pneumonia, Doug's kidney function gets worse, but because he doesn't show any symptoms, it goes unchecked. And in the months which follow his operation, Doug gradually develops chronic kidney disease. So despite successful surgery for cancer, Doug is actually less healthy than before and eventually requires kidney dialysis treatment on the NHS. When we zoom out and look at this pathway and see Doug's repeat visits to hospital, we can see it's very complicated and uses lots of resources. Let's compare that to another pathway for Doug, where we take a simpler, more integrated approach. So how does it work? In this scenario, Doug is referred to a perioperative medicine team as soon as the surgery is planned, and one of the doctors on the team, in this case an anaesthetist, will oversee his care throughout the pathway. This gives his GP a service they can raise his other medical problems with, so the perioperative medicine team realise Doug has a high risk of complications and runs some quick tests. This helps the team identify all his conditions up front. Using this information, the perioperative medicine team decide to help him stop smoking, and put Doug on an exercise program to improve his lung function before surgery. The team also alert a kidney physician to monitor Doug's kidneys before and after surgery. Now, after Doug goes in for his successful surgery, he is admitted to the critical care unit for a couple of days straight after the operation. So he gets extra care from the nurses and doctors, as well as physiotherapy. All of this helps him avoid pneumonia and he gets to go home quicker. 
The perioperative physician, the kidney physician, and Doug's GP all stay in touch, monitoring Doug's condition and adjusting his medicine so he avoids a return to hospital and doesn't need dialysis. It's clear that this pathway is better for Doug and frees up hospital beds, meaning fewer operations are cancelled for other patients. Currently, over £16 billion is spent every year on surgery in the NHS, and we believe perioperative medicine will help NHS commissioners and providers achieve even more with this money. That might seem ambitious, but the good news is that all the skills and personnel are already available within the NHS. We simply propose organising them into perioperative medicine teams to assess and treat patients before surgery, to coordinate their care in hospital, and to review any unresolved problems after they go home. Each patient would remain under the care of the perioperative medicine team throughout their entire journey. This would give GPs and surgeons a point of contact, centred around the patient, providing better communication. Most patients are at low risk of complications and won't need a major change to their pathway of care. But for the growing number of high-risk patients, we can make small changes to vastly improve their treatment. This thinking is being put into practice already. Four out of five NHS hospitals already have some form of anaesthetic assessment clinic. Exercise testing before surgery is available in two out of five NHS hospitals. And 92 hospitals are taking part in a major clinical trial to develop perioperative medicine for patients who need emergency abdominal surgery. It's time to work together to make perioperative medicine a reality, setting up the NHS to provide efficient, high-quality care for every patient who needs major surgery. Thanks for watching. So I was involved in the team that made this film, so it's slightly dear to my heart. I must have watched it hundreds of times now. And I still feel impressed by the simplicity of what perimoptive medicine is. And by the ease in which we could implement it if we all stood up together as one and just said, we're going to do this and we're going to do it now. And it would happen. Because there is no single innovation in medicine that happened without doctors making it happen, that happened without doctors wanting it to happen. And whether we think it's difficult or whether we think it's easy is irrelevant. We know the first step is to stand up and push as a group, as an entirety, to push for what we think can improve our patients' outcomes on such a large scale. So in summary, thank you for listening. We know there's a lot of patients who have surgery. We know a small but important number have poor outcomes that could be modified. And we know that there's inequalities in the care they receive that's important and matter to our patients. And that we, as a group of doctors, can be more of the best of ourselves to deliver improved quality of care for those patients, adapting it to each individual patient who has complex needs. So with that, I'll stop droning on. Thank you for listening. Uh, if there is time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, uh, please, uh, please go ahead and uh, approach with questions. Please, in front there. Uh, I'm so, uh, Anna Sedborg is my name. I'm so impressed that you got together and made this film. And I, I just wanted to know, it was funded by the Royal College. Yeah. So are we up for it? Are we going to make uh, films like this? Maybe not as good as yours, but we'll try uh, to make it in our uh, languages. Because I think if politicians, general public and so on can see this as a disease for everybody, like heart disease, cancer, death from surgery is, is, is up there with the rest of them. But we need to, to find the awareness. So. When the idea came to make a film, I, I begged the college to fund it. And, and I said, I will like, give up as much of my time as is needed to make it happen. And the college administrator said, I'm going to hold you to that. 
Uh, but actually, making the film was a lot of fun. There was a company in East London in Hackney uh, uh, that, that made it for us. It cost £10,000, which is about five euros by today's conversion rate. Uh, uh, um, and the, the, the film is freely available on YouTube, and the College of Anaesthetists openly welcomes anybody modifying the film. We can introduce you to the company that made it, uh, and if you want to make a modified version, or, or a Swedish language version, or a Norwegian language version, because we do actually know you all speak different languages other than English, uh, 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 you, you just speak English better than we do. What do you expect us to think? Uh, uh, um, so you're welcome to use it if you think it would be helpful, and, and if you need any advice, let me know, and I'll sort it out for you. There was someone over here somewhere. Thank you, thank you. I just great talk. Thank you so much. It's, it, it's a massive topic, isn't it? And I, uh, I mean, we've been trying these things in our hospitals, and I, uh, we, we, you meet so much resistance when you start it, don't you? And I, uh, how do you? I mean, it always requires reorganisation. It requires sometimes some upfront investment. How do you convince people to to take this on board? How do you? talk to managers to tell them that we need to reorganize and we need to free up time for doing these things and we're probably not all the time in the operating room producing outcome of these things. How do you do that? Have I convinced you? Yeah, you have convinced me, you're absolutely right, but I mean I've been trying this uh, in my place for uh, 12 years now without having making significant progress. Is it me? Um, <laughs> I think that we should be kind to our colleagues and recognize that change is painful. Change can be expensive, change can be difficult. Change needs justification, change needs a reason. Um, I can wait, I can be patient, I can be determined. I can pitch up every week at every meeting and politely ask for this to happen and politely accept the answer is no and come back next week and ask again and again and again and again until by the very presence of me as one individual person People will get it. Sooner or later, they will start to think, maybe even him, even that nutter Pierce has got something worth listening to. And then I've opened that little crack. And through that crack, we do more and more and more. And that's just me. What if we all did that together at the same time, in the same polite, professional, respectful, determined, patient way? This is what we've done before. This is what we did to make surgery safe and anesthesia safe, and we can do it again. It just takes a bit of time and a bit of patience. If you're going to get a microphone, just Mikael Bodesson is a very good guy. In Australia, there's a huge disparity between uh, perioperative medicine in the public system in which I work and the private. I had to see my... 83-year-old mother have an extended right hemicolectomy with an iron transfusion only on my insistence um, with a hemoglobin of 80-something. Um, how do you suggest we... So I work in a country with the biggest example of socialism in the world, and that's the National Health Service in the UK. Um, and the National Health Service in the UK is held up as the ultimate example of why healthcare is awful in another country, the United States of America. Okay? And we are mystified in the UK at why people vote for Christmas when they are a turkey. Um, and that's what they've done. They, they voted to dismantle uh, socialised healthcare. I think quality will be the death of private healthcare. That's my, I don't mean that as a politically motivated thing. Yeah. I mean, it's a genuine belief. I think quality and the quality movement is starting in public health care sector where people are funded to do quality improvement work. Nobody's funded to do quality improvement in a private hospital because if you take the morning off to do quality improvement, someone nicks your list and then they get it next week too and you've lost income and nobody's going to do that. So the private sector doesn't get the quality improvement and it falls a little bit behind and a little bit behind and then suddenly the wealthy middle class will wake up one day and realize they get better care 
in the dirty public hospital than they do in the nice, shiny private hospital. And then private healthcare is in big trouble. And people are starting to realize that about acute healthcare in the UK. And they're not getting acute care healthcare in the public, private sector anymore. And I think the same will happen in surgery. I don't take any pleasure in it because patients are getting harmed. But I think that's what the future holds. I genuinely believe that. Okay, thank you very much. You know, uh, the organizers had fixed a, some flowers for me, but I didn't find them. So I was thinking, you know, uh, maybe I should give you that one instead. You can <laughs> choose. If you want to bring that back home, I, I fix it. Yeah, it will fit in hand luggage, no problem. <laughs> so thank you very much. It's a Excellent. Thank you. We are very happy. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. you can take both. <laughs> thank you very much.